All right, hello everyone to today's uh, virtual session about the application of semiotics in brand building. And our guest today is Josh Glenn. Hello, Josh. Hi, JP. Where are you joining us actually from? I'm in my office here in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston, Massachusetts, USA. And Josh is, he calls himself the lead analyst, but really he's also the co-founder of a consultancy called Semiovox that is specialized in using semiotics and doing what he calls semiotics fueled consulting. In our context, I would call it semiotics fueled brand building. Uh, and he's gonna uh, give us very practical examples of first, what is semiotics and then how you apply it. Now, some of you might remember the name, it might sound familiar, and that's probably because I might have shared this slide before uh, during class when we talked about uh, the power of storytelling and actually the value that is being accrued behind good storytelling. So in addition to good stories being memorable and shared, it also has a clear consequence on uh, the value you can extract uh, from objects that have a good story. You might remember this slide also where Josh, I think I quote you or maybe Rob Walker, your partner in crime on this project, you transformed literally junk uh, into a 20x times value increase. And that's usually a power slide that kind of blows uh, marketers away because while everyone kind of agrees that stories are important, the clear value of meaning that stories uh, imbue uh, has never been as clear as that. And we just chatted pre this uh, call, you say this is a evergreen project, right? You did it in 2012 and it's still hot. Yeah, people still talk about it all the time. It's sort of taken on a life of its own and you know, people have their own spins on it and versions of it. And in fact, marketing professors are, are trying to re replicate it in more kind of laboratory-like conditions. And it was on uh, NPR's Marketplace this morning because there was a documentary about objects that mentions our project. So yeah, strangely enough, this one project um, has really captured a lot of imaginations. Nine years going and you're still a superstar through significant <laughs> objects. But today, we're going to look a little bit at the other side, which is looking at objects that already hold meaning and trying to extract this meaning and understand uh, the meaning of these objects. And, and, and the objects can really be, if I understand it right, you call it signs. I'm sure you'll get to that in a second, but these signs can be anything. They can be an object, a packaging, uh, an ad, whether it's printed or a film or even simple words that we're using and you're extracting from them the meaning. And that is my rough definition of semiotics before we have you, the professional, share what it is. But that should serve as an introduction. So welcome again, Josh. Take us from here. What is semiotics in more professional terms? Yep. Thanks, JP. And just jump in with any questions along the way so you can help, you know, stop me wherever it gets too woolly or confusing or I'm talking too fast and make sure that um, your students are getting the most out of this. You bet. So um, what I often tell clients who don't know what semiotics is, is that, you know, in their world, um, uh, the brand and comms world, they tend to be very focused on messages, propositions, and benefits, which is, of course, what you should be focused on. But that's quite reductionist because those messages and benefits and propositions are happening within a cultural context, right? So there's a saying that um, it doesn't matter what brands say so much as what consumers hear. So you can have your best brands and messages and propositions in the world. Consumers are gonna hear those messages from you through, filtered through a network of assumptions that they have around the category, around products, around certain cultural ideas, around being, for example, uh, being a tough mom or being a confident man or whatever it is. We all absorb a lot of um, you know, this huge contextual apparatus just by being part of a culture every day. We don't do it on purpose. It's just, we're, that's what we're good at. Our brains are very good at making sense of things through a network that is constructed for us by the culture to some extent. We don't have full free will to decide what things mean for ourselves. So um, consumer research is not that good at getting at that network of assumptions for the simple reason that 
Um, we don't all know what we know, right? We all have a lot of implicit knowledge, tacit knowledge, as it's sometimes called, that we can't easily call up to mind. So if you ask us, you know, to tell me everything that coffee means in your culture, we'll, we'll have, be able to say some of those things about coffee. And if we say, tell me how those things are expressed, what languages, what visuals express those meanings, we'll be able to say some of them, but there's a lot more out there that we just don't, we can't call to mind. So consumer research is faulty for that reason. I like consumer research and we use it in my practice on every project, but it's, I think it needs something else to complement it. And that's where semiotics comes in. So semiotics is a social science. It's actually as old as sociology and anthropology, but you haven't really heard of it because it wasn't really talking about humans until more, more quite recently. It was talking about language and then to some extent literature for a long time. And then only since the 90s or so has it really been coming to the kind of cultural and commercial world. But it's a science of studying how meaning works, what things mean and how things mean what they mean within particular cultural spaces. And then that can also be applied into this world of branding, right? Um, what things mean in a particular product category or service category or a cultural space that your product is playing in and how things mean what they mean. And what is the whole, we want to surface this whole network of assumptions and meanings that we all have in our heads, even though we may not realize it, so that to, to give better tools to um, our clients, the brands, as well as their agency partners, for even before they write their briefs, even before they do their consumer research, before they write their marketing or design brief, we want to give them kind of a landscape, big picture um, sense of what how what things mean and how things mean what they mean in that space. So that was a long time on one slide. I'll go a little faster now. I can see JP rolling his eyes, wanting me to hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, so when I say what things mean and how they mean what they mean, what I'm saying is for any particular brand, in this case, on this slide, it's a brand called Once Upon a Farm. Brands communicate through, across a lot of uh, platforms and channels, right? There's your packaging, there's advertising, there's social media, there's your YouTube videos, there's in-store displays, there's your website. Um, and then there's, of course, ways that consumers might talk about you on social media. There's other, there's kind of consumer created things about your brand as well. Uh, if, you're, if your brand is doing a good job of telling a good story, back to that stories, which is what JP started this presentation about, um, you, should, you should have a limited number of what we call codes that are being expressed in your story of your brand. And the code is a combination of things. So in, in academic semiotics, would actually I would call it a sign. And then I would say that the sign is made out of a signifier and a signified. I don't use that language because it confuses my clients and my background is in journalism. I just invented myself as a semiotician 20 years ago. I try to keep it a little more straightforward and easy for the clients. So I call these little round colorful bubbles you see here, I call those the codes instead of signs. And instead of saying signifiers and signifieds, I say norms and forms. I say that every cultural space, in this case, it's, it's around real food, uh, this particular study. Every, um, every, every cultural or category space has certain norms, meaning certain ideas, certain values, and certain um, higher order benefits, functional and, and emotional benefits that are expressed in that space. And then it has certain forms, meaning visual and verbal cues that bring those ideas, values, and benefits to life for consumers in this space. So when you find uh, a, a norm and a form working together across a number of brands in this study, you, you say, okay, we found one of our codes. Um, there's a certain idea or value or benefit it's often expressed using the same color scheme or um, facial expressions or typography or whatever it is that um, is bringing that, that idea or value to life. Um, by the way, I'm showing you real life examples from my consulting practice. So that's why you're seeing some of the top of these slides all the time. I just wanna quickly say that in my practice, we work over a lot of different kinds of categories. We don't like to um, specialize in any one category. And that's actually really valuable to our clients because oftentimes we're, if we're, if we're talking to a hot sauce client like Tabasco at the bottom right there, we might be bringing them inspiration from the world of beer or salad dressing or something else that's, that might be near to them or far from them, but it has some kind of codes that they can actually leverage and use and, and find interesting uh, ways to bring them, bring them on board. So it's, it's helpful to be working across a lot of categories. The other thing I wanna mention on this page is that the kinds of studies that we do tend to be either a category study. So for example, a client might say, can you just help us understand what's happening in the world of hot sauce? What are all the codes of hot sauce? Or it might be more of a high order benefit study. And they might say, our brand is about positive aging. It's about purity. It's about premiumness. It's about Britishness, whatever it is. Can you help us understand that? So not just how that works in our category, 
but other product categories as well as in pop culture, uh, social media and so forth. So either a kind of hey, cultural study or a product study, go ahead. Hey Josh, can I do a self test here? Can you go back one slide? If I understood and my understanding is very rudimentary, so I'm trying this out, semiotics, right. Then I can, for example, look at this packaging, look at the word farm and say, that can be a signifier for people. And the signified could actually be what's below it, what's depicted below it, that they have that in their head, this little farmhouse, red, etc. Very cultural because in Germany, it might be a different picture that comes up versus the Midwest or in Brazil, let's say. So farm is the word, it's the signif uh, is the signified. The signified is what I have in my head. But then my understanding is it can go even deeper, right? And you might get into that where all of that also connotes something which the manufacturer here might want to use, which is farm is natural and natural is good. Do I get kind of the broad concepts yeah. right here? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And of course, it's not just the word farm, it's the typography that's being used here. So it's a little bit amateurish and funky and you know fun looking, which signifies that this particular brand doesn't want to be too professional, right? They're, 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 they're having fun. They're doing something out of their kitchen, if you will, for love. So it's connoting a lot of emotions and ideas as well, just the, the way it looks. And then, of course, there's the illustrations and the color schemes, and you know, uh, and then and then you know, consumers are not they're not just looking at the package. They might have also seen the advertising or seen the social media. So you know, this, you, the brands are trying, the brands want to build up a whole story. As right. you say, farm you, is you, one. You want like, to kind of achieve uh, a certain kind of consistency, or at least avoid dissonance, I guess. So yeah. what could happen, for example, here I was wondering is I have this very primitive kind of writing that makes it artisanal. I have farm, I have nature, I'm thinking of that. But then the packaging itself with that big screw cap plastic thing is not exactly natural. There might be kind of a disjoint uh, 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 phenomena happening here. Is that possible? Yeah, well, you're getting right into the study. So I'm going to show you guys a real, uh, a real study that we did about real food. And that becomes one of the really interesting questions is if you, so our client was, is a, was a major CPG brand who, who made packaged food and they wanted, they recognized this is 10 years, five or six, seven years ago, I guess not 10 years, but so, several years ago now, they recognized that the American consumer, even the mainstream consumer wanted kind of real, what they call real food whether that means natural or organic or whatever that means to people, they don't just want something that was packaged in a factory. That's a problem for this brand who's very much an industrial, you know, very famous uh, packaged food brand. And their initial impulse was to go to a design agency and just say, make our food look more real. And the design agency put some burlap texture on there and they added a leaf and they used more green colors, right? All these things that agencies do. And that didn't work because you can't just change all these people's assumptions. And, and, that's, not, and that's not the only thing that's happening in the real food uh, category anyway. Real food can involve science at this point. Uh, as we can see on this slide, this brand who's, who's very fun and funky and farm-like also has some kind of science-y elements as well where they wanna use cutting edge technology. So it's important that brand realized they needed to take a step back and not just go straight to the agency. They needed to step back and look at the big picture of meaning in the space of real food. So that's what I will give you a little gotcha. insight into today. Um, so yeah, just, I know that this is a class around um, uh, beauty. So I'll just mention that we do a lot of beauty work as well. I'm not gonna talk about that today. We work around the globe a lot. It's often, it's often very valuable to do kind of cross-cultural studies where you're comparing codes and signs across cultures uh, for certain of our clients. So, Here's how we get going on our project. In this case, it's about real food. First, we, we sit down with the client and we say, help us understand what we should be studying here. So this was a category study. Now, if we, they wanted to do a cultural study, we would have looked not only at some real food brands, but we would have also looked at how real food shows up on television and movies and in um, you know, blogs about food and right food, uh, uh, food connoisseurs and foodies and books and cookbooks and so forth. right? In this case, it was really just about how, how brands are doing real food. And one of the questions is, what are the market leaders doing? What are the most successful, popular, long-lasting real food brands? How are they communicating real food across their various platforms? So here are some of the brands that we looked at uh, for that. Organic Valley, Stonyfield, 
arise in Annie's um, Kashi. Then we also want to say, listen, if you want to kind of future proof the results of this study and really understand where things are headed, you need to also look at some smaller brands. You can't just look at the winners. You have to look at people who are new to the space, who are disrupting the space in interesting ways, who are challenging the way that real food is talked about and thought about, bringing some new energy. Some of these brands might, might not survive. Some of these ideas that they're bringing in might not make it. But uh, if we look at enough of them and you know, if, we, if we make some good choices here, we can get a little bit of a sense of where things are headed in this space and how the discourse is being challenged, if you will. So we looked at Forager and Kite Hill and Fork in the Roads and Hip Chick and some other kind of brands that you might find at a Whole Foods or at a cool you know, uh, organic food store in Brooklyn or something, not your mainstream supermarket kind of brands. Uh, so that's the first important step. In, and there's a saying in programming, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't look at the right stimulus going in, at the end of the day, you're gonna spend weeks and weeks doing this huge study and present it to the client and they're not gonna be happy with it because you didn't look at the right stimulus. So we have to make sure we get that right up front. And we do spend several days working just on, the, on designing the stimuli. Then we go out and do the research. So I've just included a few examples of the kinds of research that would come up here, the kinds of stimuli that would come up from a project like this. So for example, with Greenfield, as we can see again, there's a kind of handwritten look. Um, it's written in a kind of very slangy vernacular way saying things like, it's time to let nature do its thing. It looks a little bit like a manifesto. There's things that are underlined and circled. Um, and again, it's green. It looks, you know, so there's a whole um, vibe of kind of DIY, artisanal fun, but also a little bit political, a little bit protesty, right? So that's, that's one vibe we're getting here. Oscar Mayer, obviously uh, a huge kind of uh, more industrial sort of food brand, but they have this natural um, sub-brand, <clears throat> Natural Selects. And as you can see, they have kind of a crumpled brown paper packaging in the background and sort of distressed typography. And I would not say this is like super successful and compelling compared to some other things we'll see here, but you can see that they're trying to go for a certain vibe. In this case, almost like uh, less about nature than more about culture. It's more about being old fashioned, being vintage, harking back to kind of old fashioned butcher shops. Um, and that's why you should believe this is real food, not because it's coming from a great farm necessarily, but because it's coming from like an old fashioned butcher shop. So there's kind of a cultural way of talking about real food that we see here. Um, uh, Oatly, talks about science. They talk about how they developed um, these, you know, new um, fibers that uh, for their liquid oats. And they kind of present it almost like, um, you know, Apple would present like a new iteration of the iPod. It's like a breakthrough is happening here. There's a technological breakthrough that has happened. And somehow that's, and, and they're also using a kind of handmade look and it feels fun and they're very relaxed and um, slangy in the way they talk. So they're doing a couple of things here. On the one hand, they're being kind of cool and hipster and relaxed but they're also being like a kind of technological breakthrough kind of brand, which that's very different from what we've already seen so far in this stimulus. So you can see that just by choosing a variety of stimuli here, we're already seeing a lot of different ways that real food can be communicated. Here's a, a Horizon ad where, as we can see, the most important thing is taking care of your child, who's very maternal, very domestic, very um, comforting and nurturing, an important aspect of real food, because that's who's buying the real food is right, whoever, typically the mom, but uh, increasingly the father, but what we call the gatekeeper is in charge of bringing the real food into the home. So what's important to them is their child, not so much necessarily the ingredients or the farm, but you know they wanna protect their child. Stonyfield, very much going for that kind of farm look. You know, it's all about you know, the green nature and the splashing and the little cow in the background. And it's very innocent and um, kind of Eden-like. Exo is a brand that uses cricket flour and they really uh, focus on kind of hipsters in Brooklyn. So you don't see sort of crickets in nature. You see guys with tattoos and people in kind of urban settings and graffiti in the background and so forth. And then Beyond Meat is another example of like, here's a guy in a white coat in a laboratory cracking the code on building meat. That seems a bizarre thing. If you told me 10 years ago that that would be a code from the, the world of real food, I would have said you were crazy, but now it makes a lot of sense. And it's actually very exciting and sexy and interesting for their brand. I wouldn't say that like Horizon might want to do that, but um, for Beyond Meat, it makes a lot of sense to have a kind of a, and, he, and also you'll notice it's not like a, a classic kind of super sterile scientific lab. He's got a scruffy beard. You can see like a little bit of lettuce floating around there. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit kind of um, slightly funky and interesting yeah. kind of lab, not just super sterile. In, in a way, it's back to the future because in the 50s, 
you know, um, all the scientific discoveries, including in food, were celebrated and people were excited about, you know, industrial baking mix because it was really, uh, you know, a wonder of scientific development. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I, I did a job for Hershey some years ago and they were really early on, they were all about how, you know, chocolate made by a baker is full of impurities and like there might be rat feces in it. And you know what I mean? It's, you don't know what's happening. We make it in a factory. We stamp it out like a, out of a mold. That's why Hershey's has that very significant kind of metal stamping look on it. And they're still running with that idea years later, even though nobody knows anymore that that's why, that's why they started it. Cause it's, yeah, like you say, factory production was, that's what you wanted in the, in the mid century. A greenfield is kind of going for a, um, you know, sort of rotogravure, um, old-fashioned 1920s printed kind of look. It's sort of the style of the illustration, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, very kind of no-nonsense kind of language and way of presenting the information. Misfit is very, you know, fun and weird and um, cool. And again, that they're, they're getting at real food from a kind of cultural uh, angle. There's hundreds of pieces of stimuli in a study like this, sometimes thousands. Uh, so I'm only, only showed you a few here, but just to give you an example, you're looking at a dizzying array of, of words, of images, of facial expressions, of colors, of typography. And then the question is, what are, what's the signal within the noise here? What ideas are being expressed by all of these stimuli that we created? What values are being expressed? What higher order benefits are being expressed? And how are they being expressed? And are we seeing the same expressions in the same way, the same what and the same how over and over again. If so, we found a code. And what are all those codes? So, um, I, so I call them codes or source codes. Um, technically, in semiotics, a code is a binary opposition. So it's a, a code would be, you know, um, uh, male versus female or hot versus cold. You wouldn't just have one side of it. Um, so I'm, I'm misusing the language slightly, but it's something that my clients like. So we stopped using sign a long time ago. But we're, again, we're trying to find a norm and a form. So the idea, the value, the benefit, and then the, the way it's brought to life. So in, in the example here of exotic source, the, we were seeing a lot of language around, you know, the idea that it's Swedish, uh, a taste of home, or we were seeing images of something from India. Or we were seeing textures, um, for example, inside the tea on the honest tea that signified some kind of exotic culture that wasn't, wasn't America, wasn't the West. And so we, even though these aren't, even though these don't, these don't look exactly the same, all these images, one thing we realized was that, okay, in this world of real food, one of the ideas here, one of the norms is that certain cultures and traditions outside of America produce food that is extra pure and extra delicious. Um, and there can be various ways of showing it uh, through typography and design cues and, and uh, images, but there's, there's this one idea that we want to capture call that a code and then move on. And the idea is just to kind of capture as many as you can and keep going until you've got them all. So uh, when I'm showing students uh, this work, I usually show 22 of those um, stimuli slides and then I ask them what kind of um, patterns they see here, but maybe JP, maybe you want to play. You <laughs> see certain kind of recurring patterns, whether it's colors or typography or facial expressions, there's no wrong answers. Yeah, so I, 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 one thing I noticed is this cursive kind of handwritten, artisanal, put together, lines are not straight, some scriggling on it, etc. cetera. Um, overall, also this idea of imperfection, like you say, the crumbled paper or, you know, not exactly square package um, and so forth. Um, then I don't know how to describe this, but there's still a little bit of this uh, minimalist uh, black on white, like in the butcher box, the epic, uh, that kind of clean look, whereas the others are playing already in the more decorative kind of, um, you know, colorful, um, uh, colorful tones, etc. So you're, you're, if you're talking about opposites, you know, on the one hand, you have the sepia kind of romantic number eight um, versus, um, you know, maybe very progressive kind of number 22. It's almost like, is that a homeless person or what's going <laughs> on, etc. you know? Yep, yep. All right, you, you, you hit on a number of interesting things here already. So here's a few more of the codes that came out of the study. So one of them was the use of the word 100%, which we kept seeing come up over and over again. 
And I think if you had asked me before going into this process, what 100% means in the context of real food, I would have said purity. But as we looked at more and more examples, we saw that sometimes it means pure, purity, but sometimes it means something else like 100% air chilled, 100% vegetarian feed, 100% grass fed protein. And so we realized that really in the grander scheme of things, what 100% means in this space is the idea that there was an impossible goal to achieve and we achieved it. So that might've been a goal about purity, but it might've been a goal about something else. The point is that we achieved something that nobody thought we could do. So that's an important code in this world of, of uh, real food. The inspired amateur, so you pointed to this one, JP, the idea that um, this, this kind of visual code of very informal, very personal, very friendly, um, crooked, uneven, um, handwritten notes superimposed on images. And then the language is also tends to be kind of uh, informal and personal. So we say that we think that what that means here, and again, we're, we're just making hypotheses at the point. We're not talking to consumers. We're just making our own best educated guesses, which all can be validated with consumers down the road. But right now the question is just, what are all the, what do we think all the codes are? And we think that this one is about the idea that we don't want to be too professional because that signifies this world of like stamped out processed factory food. And we are more of a out of the barn or out of a kitchen or out of a garage, right? It's a little more DIY and artisanal so that therefore we need to have this kind of more amateurish look, but not amateurish in a bad way. That's why we call it inspired amateur. Um, it's, you know, amateur. We, we actually are quite professional, but we have an amateurish spirit. Magically easy was one that came up where we were seeing a kind of a sense of wonder and imagination. So it's sort of like a Wes Anderson-y um, vibe in some ways, or a cartoony or anime kind of vibe, very childlike colors and uh, music and imagery, but also in a kind of sophisticated way. So not just like a child's cartoon, but a more uh, evolved cartoon, maybe a little psychedelic at times. Hipster stuff. So uh, you pointed this one out as well, JP, this idea that real food doesn't necessarily just have to be um, validated by being coming from a farm. It can be because hipsters like it and we trust hipsters. They, they're on the cutting edge of culture. They're, they're always looking for the newest, best thing. They do more research than we do. They're interested in the latest, newest, best thing. So maybe if they like it, then it's something that we can trust. So that's another way to kind of validate the realness of the food is that hipsters are into it. What, what do you understand by hipster? Because um, <laughs> I find it's, it's evolving over time. It used to be the bearded guys with the ax living in Brooklyn, but now I'm confused what it means. Yeah, well, so what we were seeing here was sort of the use of, there's no reason for like tattoos to appear prominently in a real food ad, unless you're trying to say that this type of person is someone that we can trust as a connoisseur of food. So I'm using hipster in, that, in a fairly, in a non too specific sense, but sort of the certain, a certain look like the woman with the stocking cap on, the hipsters, the, the you know, the glittery um, silver nail polish and the thumb ring we see at the bottom left, the, the kind of the context, so the urban spaces, the graffiti, being in a coffee shop, um, you know, it's, it's basically a young urban person who's not, you know, a straight-laced member of society who we can trust as a connoisseur of real food. But, but the non-straight-lacedness is almost an I ideological statement, right? You would expect them to possibly dress differently, but it is a statement that they're making. Yeah, we trust their judgment about food because they look like this. But there's also, we also have seen like moms and sort of mainstream people here and we trust their judgment because they're moms. Right, right. It's not just hipsters that we're looking at. There's the butcher shop. So again, this idea that it's not just about the farm that we trust, it's actually old fashioned ways of less, more simple, less artificial, less pro mass produced ways of doing things. So the brown paper, the wood block style typography, the rotogravure style illustration. And I should point out that in many of these packages and advertisements and so forth, there's more than one code happening here. So it's not just one image equals one code. There might be three or four codes coming out of any one particular image. Uh, we don't really know that until we kind of go through the whole process and it's, you know, it takes us several weeks to, to do these studies. We talked about the tech upgrade, the idea of introducing food like it's a breakthrough and talking about things being amazing and cutting edge and cracking the code. Again, something that seems quite strange uh, in the context of real food until you start looking closely and then you realize that it's actually becoming quite a normal thing now. Positive vibes. So here's just the idea that um, what we want for our children is for them to have a positive, uh, energetic, uplifted kind of day. So we're seeing kids being happy and energized and, and having fun. And then the food is just, you know, we may not even see the food. They might be consuming it or it might just be implicit 
but basically we're just showing you happy, healthy children. And that, that's a reason to believe in this brand's real food credentials. So that's just some of the codes. Um, typically we might have anywhere from 25 to 50 codes. It really depends on the scope, but also depends on the category. So some categories just, there's more advertising, there's more packaging. So there's just more to talk about. Some, some do you shield your clients from that or do you let them look at the 50 codes? So we, it's a great question. You're getting to the strategy of it now, the strategy of, of handling clients. So we usually ask for our clients to create a small core team that's going to see everything. So we will present to them as we go through, as we get to the point when we finish the codes, we're going to present all the codes to that core team. And then as we finish our maps, we're going to show our maps to that core team. Then when we get to the work session at the very end where we figure out how to activate all these learnings, we then say, hey, invite anyone you invite, but want. invite your larger team, invite stakeholders, invite your agency partners. We'd love to have your marketing or design uh, agencies there. They don't see everything. They don't want to see everything. They don't have time to go through you know, 45 codes, but the core team knows what the codes are. So they're there to kind of tell you, yes, we believe that these guys, you know, they did a good job with the codes and, and these maps make a lot of sense because they did good work getting to these maps. Gotcha. But typically the larger group, they don't want to see everything. Especially right. if, you're, if you're dealing with like C-suite folks, they definitely do not want to see everything. Yes. Um, so another tool we develop here um, is what's called residual dominant emergent. So that's basically just us offering an informed hypothesis, again, without talking to consumers at this stage, as to how top of mind we think these codes are for consumers in this market at this time. So uh, is, is the code um, no nonsense or farm faces are magically easy? Do we believe that it is something that this is a way of thinking about real food. This idea or value is sort of top of mind for consumers in this space and this way of expressing it is top of mind. If so, we call that a dominant code. And we, and we would decide something's a dominant code because we see it a lot. It came up again and again in our study. Many brands in the study are saying more or less the same ideas or value in more or less the same way. If we're just seeing it again and again, we say, okay, this, is, this code is dominant. If we did consumer research, and ask people about real foods, some of these ideas and ways of expressing them would come up in the consumer research. However, consumer research is not as good at getting consumers to talk about what we call residual codes, which are codes that are feeling cliched at this point. The ideas are kind of old fashioned or the way they're expressing the ideas are old fashioned. Um, and consumers don't tend to tell us about that. We like to know about those codes because it gives us some context of where things have been. And when you can see where things have been and where they are now, that begins to give you a trajectory of where things are headed. We also like to know about what we call the residual codes because there is some affection for those codes that still exist out there. And if we can find a way to bring them back to life in a way that's contemporary and relevant and engaging, they can be very, very powerful. But again, consumer research has a harder time telling us about those old cliches. So it's, that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to find is, you know, what are, some, what are some of the older ideas or ways of talking about them? And then consumers also have a hard time, unless they're very kind of cutting edge, early adopter kind of consumers, they have a hard time telling you about the emerging codes. So these are coming from brands usually who are disrupting the category in some way. They are challenging the way that we think about, in this case, real food. So maybe it's the idea they're bringing in science into it, or they're bringing in the idea of being magical somehow. Um, they're bringing in some new idea that we haven't seen in the space before. And that, I, again, that this emerging code might become, an, might succeed and take root and become a dominant code eventually, or it might be a flash in the pan and vanish. We can't really predict that. But um, we like to sort of be able to give our clients that whole spectrum to begin to help them future-proof their marketing, their packaging, their positioning as we go forward. To some extent, this sounds like a translation also of brand strategy. If I think of like classics like Keller, for example, he would talk about points of parity and points of difference, where points of parity are kind of the table stakes that you need to present as a laundry detergent, as a food, whatever it is. And that you would probably call the residual or dominant and then the differentiation, which might be more emergent or unique to you. Is that right? Yeah, uh, we, although we actually call some of these codes table stakes. So the codes that you see in black on this slide are codes that um, we, we sort of come to this realization after we create our maps and we realize that some of these codes could fit anywhere on the map. And that means they don't really help you stand for anything. They're right. just table stakes for the category. So it's good to know about them, but they're not actually that interesting as far as building your brand. 
But yes, like you say, there, there is a brand strategy component to all this. I don't actually call myself a brand strategist. I feel that a brand strategist needs to have a, a much bigger picture of the context. For example, how valuable all these brands are, like what, what are the dollar signs attached to these brands? I don't concern myself with that typically and brand strategists would need to. But this is obviously what we're trying to do is provide really, really valuable um, tools for brand strategy, whether that's happening in-house or whether we're working with a brand strategist. So, so yeah, in this case, we had 40 uh, codes. As you can see, most of them are dominant and then a number of emergent, a number of residual, and then a few that are what we call table stakes. Uh, and then we map them. This is becomes, this is like kind of the most important charismatic tool that comes at the end of our process. We can't, we don't go in to this process having a strong idea of what's good and bad or works and doesn't work in the real food space. In fact, we try to unknow what we, what we think we know and go in like we're alien anthropologists visiting from another planet. We really wanna have as much of a blank slate as we can when we go in. Um, so you will see that uh, whereas most um, consultants will show you a, if they're showing you a four quadrant map, it's usually a square or a rectangle. And that is because there's usually a good and a bad axis. So what ends up happening and typically is that the bottom left of their four quadrant map is the bad place to be. That's the, the moribund place, the stuck place. That's where you are usually, right? That's where you're, and then the good place to get is the top right, that's the future. And this is just, that's a semiotic thing. And our, if you look at magazine covers, when people are looking up and to the right, it suggests the future and when they look down to the left, they're sort of sad and looking into the past. So um, because we create our maps differently, we don't have pre preconceived ideas of what's good and bad here. We're trying to just show you what's happening in a very empirical way. What's, what are the meanings here? What's happening in the space right now? And we looked at good brands to get there. So there actually shouldn't be any bad quadrants in our maps. So we uh, years ago started using a, a circular map instead of a square map to get to stop our clients from thinking that we had an opinion about what the right quadrant was to be in. Uh, and then more recently, in the last couple of years, I started subdividing um, my four territories into what I call themes, so that you end up having 16 themes, and that helps us just get even more uh, precise when we're talking about positioning platforms and you know ways that brands can play inside of these four territories. I was a little frustrated by just having four territories because even within the territories, there's differentiation between the brands. So I've now divided into the themes. I will very quickly say that semiotics is a structuralist discipline, meaning that we do operate on a system of binaries. We do think that that's how the human mind works, that we don't know what hot is unless we know what cold is. We don't know what dark is unless we know what light is. So when you look at one of our maps, uh, it's important as we're going through it with our clients, we like to point out that these territories that are diametrically opposed to one another on the map are, suggest, are, are communicating something very different, in this case about real food, a very different emotional proposition about what real food is about. However, territories that are next to one another actually have something in common. They share one axis in common with each other. Is this uh, derived from this famous, uh, I think it's semiotic box or something like that? Yeah, so there is a, a, a Lithuanian mythographer named Grimas who has a four quadrant square. He actually borrowed it from um, Aristotle. It's actually an ancient, um, way of talking about logical binary oppositions. But um, Grimas popularized it in the world of semiotics in the 50s and 60s. So that's why I call my map a G schema, partly after Grimas, partly <laughs> after the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, who was very inspired by semiotics, and I, and I find his work very inspiring, partly after Gadamer, who's a hermit <laughs> of interpretation. And his I thought it was after Glenn. And it's then after me too. <laughs> so the G schema. So in the case of real food, one, so we, what we do is just kind of mix and mass and shuffle around all of our codes and try to understand, are there two big oppositions here that we can find to give us four quadrants? So one of the big oppositions here is that we realize, okay, about half of our codes are about nature. They're reflecting the idea that consumers want products and ingredients that seem they come, they come straight from the farm. They weren't touched by human hands. They weren't adulterated. They weren't processed. They're very authentic and natural and wholesome. And that's something that we would expect going into a study like this. Yes, we, we would have expected to find a lot of nature codes. However, we also found quite a lot of codes that aren't about nature at all, they're about culture. They're about not so much the ingredients as about the meals. They're about not so much the farm as about traditions and recipes and how grandma did it and how old fashioned butcher shops do it. Um, so that becomes an interesting way to divide up our, our map here. There's a, there's a part of the map that's about nature and a part of the map that's about culture. That gives us one of our two axes here, nature versus culture. We then divided the same codes um, in another way and said, okay, we're, what we're seeing here is that quite a lot of the codes are about the family. 
They're about the idea that what consumers want in the real food space is something that's gonna help them keep their family happy and healthy. But we also see quite a lot of codes that aren't about the family at all. They're about the individual who wants to improve their body's performance, who wants to explore the world through exotic food experiences, who's, a, who's an adventurous eater, who's uh, interested in, um, you know, sort of interesting cultural aspects of food and is not, that he or she is not trying to primarily worried about their family's health. So um, listen, there's other ways you can slice and dice these things. We basically have 30 or 40 go-to um, binary oppositions that we try out against the codes. Um, and every single study, there's a different set. We almost never have the same map twice. Um, and sometimes we're coming up with new binary oppositions based on what we're seeing, but um, it's an experiment. And we're trying to come up with uh, oppositions that on the one hand are, are gonna be really useful for the client and helping to think about positioning and, 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 how to, and how to win in this in this world of real food. But we also want to make sure that we aren't creating good and bad quadrants. So as you can see, we don't have all of the, the emerging codes on one side of the map or the other. If I create a, um, an opposition that seems intuitively like it works for me, but then I see that all the emerging codes are showing up on one side of the map, that means I'm not doing a good job because again, we looked at good brands, all these quadrants should be good. So there shouldn't be a good or bad part of our map. Um, so having identified those four um, axes, those are the two axes with four ends to them, we can now begin to name our territories. So where nature and family meets, for example, we have a, a territory called back to basics, which is about consumers wanting wholesome, all American, tried and true farming values. So that's gonna be your very farm oriented, right, um, brands. The opposite of back to basics is forward foodie. Forward foodie is not about nature, it's about culture, and it's not about family, it's about the individual. So this quadrant is for consumers who wanna use food as a vehicle for exploring the world. So that's very different from the consumers who just want food to become straight out, straight from the cow, straight from the soil. These guys want the food to be harvested and discovered and by an adventurous explorer in India and Africa who's bringing back these amazing recipes and flavors and things that we've never tried before. So a very different idea about real food is emerging just from that dichotomy. Then at the top and the bottom, um, where, where nature meets individual, we have what we call the next wave natural. This is a kind of a political sort of space where uh, consumers might not actually trust farmers to be doing a good job of being natural. And they want sort of scientists and experts and others to come in and kind of push the farmers to be even more natural, more organic than they're being now. Um, it can also be very kind of nerdy space where consumers just want a lot of information about the food and the package is covered with words and, and numbers and charts showing you all the kind of stuff about how good the food is for you and how natural it is. The opposite of that where family meets culture is really for the gatekeeper, whether it's the mom or the dad who just wants to buy food for their family without thinking too hard about it. They want it to be good and healthy, but they don't want to, have to do all this research because they're in a hurry, they're busy. So they want... Um, a kind of a, they want their lifestyle reflected and they want it to be very simple and minimalistic and few ingredients and very um, um, easy. So we call it the keep, keep it simple space. As we're gonna see, again, the, you know, the, the, the territories that are directly opposed to one another are, are oppositional, but if they're next to each other, they share something in common. So back to basics and keep it simple are both about family, whereas back to basics and next wave natural are both about nature. I point that out because as we're going to see, some brands play in more than one territory. Mm -hmm. That's okay because um, they're sharing. So if a brand is about nature, it can be, it can decide it wants to be about nature and family and just being back to basics, or it can be about nature and the individual and be a next wave natural, or it can try to do both and play somewhere in the middle of those two. What I'm getting ahead of myself, but what I don't like to see when I'm doing my study, my, my analysis and creating these maps, I don't like to see a brand just existing in three or four quadrants. That to me suggests they are not telling a good story. It's not coherent. They're trying to be all things to all people. They want to be about nature and culture, family and the individual. And consumers are smart and they see through that. And if you're trying to be everything, then they think you're about nothing. So I like to see brands, and I, and I typically do see good brands, cluster pretty tightly either in one territory or two territories. So then we bring the codes back in. And, and again, remember, we didn't, come, we didn't come up with a map first. The codes gave us the map. So we're now, we're now we're just sort of loosely showing which codes live in which of these territories. And then we do the an even harder exercise. And most sanitations would stop there and they would just give you four quadrants with, with the codes lumped into them. I've made it harder for myself because I like to get even more specific. And I've gone to this next level of trying to develop themes within the quadrants. 
Um, so, and again, the themes are op opposite one another. So for example, um, uh, the idea of the novelty quest at top right is opposite the idea of the kitchen table at bottom left. Um, and the, so the themes are um, help you help us see uh, how brands can position themselves quite precisely within these territories or across these territories. And then we can show you which codes are most associated with each of these themes. So then when we get down to, first we'll talk about strategy with our clients usually. Where, do, where does our brand currently play on this map? Where do we see opportunities to play? Where do we have a right to move to if we want to? Where, where, can, where should we not go to because it's too far away? And also if we decide to make any of these moves or changes or refresh our positioning or packaging, what codes should we activate against? And which ones should we not activate against? So we can get very precise about tactics. And again, that might sound like we're doing the job of the agency or the brand strategist. We're just trying to put guardrails around things so they can write a very, very focused uh, brief. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but ultimately the, the point is to help the client be a better client to their agency partners or to their internal you know, marketing and design teams. So that when they say we want to be about real food, that's not the end of the story. They're saying we, we want to be about real food specifically in a way that's about nature and the family. And within that specifically being about homespun wisdom and rural tradition. And within that, we like these codes the most. So you can get incredibly specific uh, before you even write your marketing brief, your design brief, or your innovation brief. Um, and that just makes everybody happier. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we're doing the job of those agencies. We're not telling them how to create copy or, or design a package, but this is helping make things much fo more focused. Everybody's happier in the end and the client's a better client. Uh, we then, and I know we're running long here, so let me just go really quickly, but we do then do what we call brand x-rays. So we, now we know what the codes are and we know what the map of, this, of these codes looks like. Now we go back to the, co the, to the brands that we studied, the stimuli, and we ask ourselves what codes are owned by each of these brands. In other words, if you look at these brands' packaging and their advertising and their other channels of communication, what ideas and values and how do they express it and wh which, ones they, which codes do they activate against most frequently and centrally across their channels? And typically, unless you're a huge mega brand like a Dunkin' Donuts or somebody who does a lot of advertising and a lot of social media and everything all the time, typically it's going to be a fairly focused set of, you know, four to eight codes that they're activating against. And they're going to be fairly tightly focused on the map because that means that this brand is doing a good job of telling a, a fairly coherent story across all of its channels, from its advertising to its packaging and beyond. So in this case, for example, Just is playing in that keep it simple space where they're helping the busy gatekeeper who's trying to buy um, good food, wholesome food for their family and wants it to be stylish and they, and they want it to have very few ingredients that they don't want to, have to know too much about it. So they have this very minimalist, stylish packaging which suggests to you, hey, there's not a lot in here. There's probably just three ingredients here. You recognize all of them. You don't have to go, you don't have to worry about it. Just, just pick up this package and go. Trader Joe's is very much about um, adventurous. You know, and, and they're also kind of um, snarky and, and sort of not taking themselves too seriously. So the Back to Basics quadrant on the left is very earnest and pious and sentimental about the farm and the land and America and the past. And the forward foodie can be much more ironic and snarky and having fun uh, with the ideas of real food. Then Nyman Ranch, they belong in this Back to Basics space. You can see that they're very much about the farm uh, and Americana and rural, you know, being rural and so forth. Some of their um, codes are more uh, emergent or residual than others. Forager is a brand that is partly in that next wave natural space because they're all about kind of um, sort of fresh caught food and uh, you know scavenged or foraged uh, plants, but they're also about um, being smart and sustainable and a little bit political, which puts them a little bit in that back to basic space. So I would say they play kind of in the top left of the of the map. And ultimately you get, you get a map like this, where you can really see, it's almost like a, a military map where you can really see who is directly competing for consumer mind share with who. And by directly competing, I mean activating against almost the same exact set of codes as one another. Um, obviously they're not doing it completely the same, but close enough that we can really cluster them together. So you can really see that brands like, a lot of these meat brands, for example, like Nyman Ranch and Natural Choice and Peterson's, are very much just about the ranch, the farm, back to basics. Whereas um, more kind of a nerdy um, brands that are about wanting to know a lot about the food and wanting to be really cutting edge like Epic and RX and Pork in the Road are in more in that next wave natural space. But then there's a really powerful, interesting hybrid space at the top left where brands like Horizon and Annie's and Cliff, these are very successful and 
popular brands and you can sort of see why because they're having it both ways they're about the farm so they're they're appealing to that sentimental um, old-fashioned nostalgic element that we all feel when we think about real food but they're also being sciencey and progressive and they're not afraid to kind of push farmers to be more organic and they really want to they're a little bit political so that becomes an inter very interesting space for that kind of brand and then and then you can see you know there's all kinds of other spaces as well there's more right. sort of um your your uh, groovy you know um minimalist brands like kashi and kind and kite hill down at the bottom and so forth uh so this also shows that the decisions at the very beginning uh, about who to study and what to use for your study are important right because it's like you say input will make for the output we're not seeing Kellogg's in here could, could you place the very traditional GIF and Kellogg's and in here it would be tough right well because they're not about real food that's not what they're right around. right now, so so that's uh, where you might have one they might have one product is about real food we could put them in here yeah but right so it's going to be very important to be clear at the beginning what this will yield yeah. and then obviously since you're basing your study on marketing materials the outcome is a description of what is currently being talked through marketing and not for example some emerging trends that are not yet expressed through uh, uh, brands because they're purely cultural etc right. right yes now we have done real food studies it's not the only real food study that we've done. And we've done others that were less brand focused and they were, to your point, JP, we were looking at food trucks and restaurants and, mm -hmm. food blog, and blogs and so forth. And so yeah, it was, a diff it was some of the same codes that you saw here, but it was also some different codes that haven't emerged in the world of TPGs yet. Right. So actually a client could ask for this map and then also for a map about what's not yet owned by mass marketing, if you like, and ask you to go and explore the foods that are not branded yet and, and what, what, those, what, what those languages look like. Is that right? Right. And yeah, so we have various modules and ways of doing this, including we often work with consumer research. So uh, that might be a place that consumer research comes in where maybe we would, it wouldn't be traditional consumer research, we would round up foodies. So they would have to be people who were very engaged in the real food space, not just your average person off the street. And we would interview them about food trends and their own food habits. And we might be, get a little bit anthropological and go into their homes and film them cooking and talking about food. We're going to go with them to the supermarket. Um, and then, yes, you would get some insights from that that you couldn't get from just looking at brands. And that would gotcha. be, and oftentimes what we would do is do this study and do that. Or we might go out and just do kind of like you're saying, we might just go do our own analysis of these food spaces and then merge those, marry those two lines of research uh, for the client. Gotcha. So the last thing to mention here is, is how do we activate, activate, as I say here, how do we activate these insights? Um, so again, and I, I talked to this a little bit already as we were going along, but basically it depends on the project, right? So it might be a project about positioning. So maybe the brand has, you know, they established themselves as a real food brand some years ago. And they, at the time they were kind of cutting edge. Um, you think of like uh, an early um, uh, brand like, um, Oh, there's so many. <laughs> Think about um, an organic valley or somebody who's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They might have established themselves in this space early on, but now there's so many other yogurt brands and dairy brands that are talking about the farm and they're doing it in cooler ways and they're using better, more interesting and relevant, engaging typography and imagery and language and it might feel more political or more something. Um, so they've lost their way, but that doesn't mean they want to throw out all their the baby with the bathwater, right? They don't want to lose their assets just because other brands have kind of caught up and crowded and cluttered that space for them. So if we do a project like this for them, well, one thing we can do is say, okay, listen, you're currently playing in this top left space, but there's a lot of other brands trying to play there as well. You can stay there and just try to activate against the most emerging codes of that space. You can introduce some new emerging codes in that space that no one has done yet. You don't have to rely on what we found. You, you know, that these emerging codes come from somewhere. So you could be one of those somewheres introducing some new ideas. Or based on where you exist, you can move a little bit. Maybe you want to shift. Maybe you want to get away from all that kind of progressive political stuff and get it more into the farm space. In that case, some of the codes you're activating against now, you need to lose. So these are the hard, hard decisions we have to make, right? And that is brand strategy. Some of these codes you're activating on and your packaging and your advertising, you need to stop doing. And there's some a whole bunch of codes in this back to basic space. And maybe now you want to pick up some of those codes. And those, those are the kind of things we would talk about in our kind of activation sessions. 
if it's more of a packaging pro you know, project, same, same kind of thing. If it's an innovation project, then you're really looking for kind of white space, right? So you might say, what, what are, what's the kind of least crowded parts of this map? You know what I mean? For, for our brand. So if we're mm -hmm. a yogurt brand, we don't see any yogurt brands on the far right of this map, except for Siggy's. So maybe that's where we want to go. I guess Halo Top is sort of yogurt, but maybe that's where we want to go. Somewhere far away from all the other, you know, not, not even talk about farms, not talk about cows, not talk about nature, have it all be about culture, exoticness, you know, adventure, recipes, you know what I mean? All this fun urban stuff, uh, get completely get away from what, what other yogurt brands are doing. So again, we like to help clients sort of make those strategic conversation decisions about positioning, about pack design, about, you know, refurbishing their positioning, about innovating, but we also uh, about optimizing their advertising, I should mention. But we can also get tactical. So once once we kind of decide where we want to play, we can sort of really look, drill down and say, okay, well, that place that you want to go to, here's the codes that we currently found. Are any of these codes right for you? Could you could you adapt these codes to your brand? Do you want to introduce some new codes here, et cetera? So you can get very granular, uh, which again, the ultimate goal is to help them be a better client to their agencies or to their internal teams who are in charge of advertising, packaging, branding in general, right? So um, we're trying to help them really sharpen the pencil before they make any of those kind of decisions. Um, so it's kind of a luxury add-on to do semiotics, right? Because the easiest thing to do is what this big package brand I was talking about in the beginning do. You see the culture is changing. You see that your brand has fallen behind the curve. The consumers don't find you distinctive anymore. It's just a cluttered space. So you just go to a smart agency and say, fix us, you know, give us, some, give us make us more real. And... Mm -hmm. Obviously, agencies are good at what they do, but if you're giving them a vague um, directive like that, if you're just saying, make us real, that's as vague as it gets, they're going to come back with three or four ideas that they think are great, and then it's going to be a hard conversation because you might not agree with their ideas, and you, or some of you might agree, some of you might not agree, or it gets very subjective and mushy, right? You might say, well, I like purple, but the guy sitting next to me likes pink, and the person over here doesn't think either of those are good colors, and the agencies hate you, and it takes a long time, and it gets expensive. If you can get, if you can put guardrails and get more granular and specific about what you want your positioning or your packaging, your advertising and so forth, what you want your story to be um, before you go to the agencies or go to your teams, um, it just, the process is much stronger and you have a rubric to judge results by. So when the agencies come back with their ideas, you're not just saying, I like it or I don't like it. You're saying, okay, well, let's judge what you, what you gave us versus this kind of these tools that we have now and decide if that's, if you landed in the right spot. And then Excellent. we can talk about how we bring consumer research in. That's a whole other question, but that's the basic gist of semiotics. Excellent. Well, the gist, it was quite detailed. Thanks a lot for that. Now, you were talking about, so this is the study of signs. It can be language. You said originally it was actually all about language and it was written language and I guess spoken language. Um, clearly, it's also about visuals. You've shown us visuals, uh, whether they're on a packaging or in an ad. I suppose you can apply this to in-store environments. You can go immerse yourself into 20 different stores. You can try to read them and analyze them in the same way. Does it even go into, let's say, the movements and rituals that you might find in those stores? You know, how the geniuses in the Apple store uh, act and work versus, let's say, I don't know, the people at the Louis Vuitton store that put on gloves before they handle stuff. Does, or does that go too far? Does that overcharge what semiotics can do for brand interpretation, understanding? No, no. In fact, we, I mean, shop, there's, there's aspects of what we would call shopper insights that semiotics is, is not super helpful for, but there are aspects that it is very helpful for. So yes, for example, we've worked with Vitamin Shop and uh, Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf and other kind of retail retailers to look at things exactly what you're talking about, the kind of color schemes in the store, uh, how things are organized, how, the, how the, the staff is dressed, how they interact with you. Are they kind of experts? Are they there to help you and give you advice? Or are they just there to stock the shelves? Do they put on gloves before they handle the merchandise, et cetera? Are there small, little, precious, tiny containers that are under glass that are kind of like you're in a museum? Or is it like the GNC store where it's giant industrial tubs of powder stacked up like you're in a car shop? Um, so yes, we can get, um, you know, you might not get as many codes because compared to advertising and social media, there's just not as much being communicated, but there's still a lot there. So it's, we have, we've done some very interesting and rich studies around retail environments. 
plus it be, plus it becomes multi sense. I always try to remember, you know, in in semiotics, you also talk about indices, I think, or the index, which is just basically a signal that you get that would point to a sign. So what I always remember is you have the smoke and you can imagine the fire that's behind that, right? Uh, in that sense, I guess the smell of a Starbucks versus a Cinnabon or whatever, they're indices of the business and of the, of the foods that are to be expected. Yeah. So when we send, so let's say, for example, for coffee bean and tea leaf, it was a study of LA coffee shops. We sent um, analysts into 30 or 40 coffee shops in Los Angeles, both big chains as well as small independent ones. And we said, take 100 photos, take photos of everything, the people there, of the clientele, of the glassware, of the tables, of the floor, of the walls, right? Everything. But also write down all your impressions. What kind of, what's the vibe there? Is, is, is the, are people talking in low voices or loud voices? Are people moving quickly or slowly? Are the people behind the counter, do they feel like, are artists or are they just kind of, you know, fast food workers? Uh, what's the music like? What's the, what's the smell like? So yes, we kind of try to capture that vibe. Obviously hard to capture it uh, in any way by writing. They just sort of, sort of writing these things down. But then yes, that all plays into then the question of how we create these maps and, you know. What, what all Excellent. Are. Excellent. I think it's a great discipline, even for uh, anyone who is into marketing, whether it's researcher or manager or whatever, just to be more aware of the surrounding. You wanted to share some examples? Yeah, I'll just sh I, I don't want to share for, um, for you know, we sign NDAs with all of our clients, so it's hard for me to share sure. a lot of case studies, but Luna Bar has been very nice. So let it, they're very proud of this work and they've, been, they've let us share it. And it is about uh, women and to some extent about beauty. So I thought it might be helpful a little bit for your, your class. So Luna Bar was the, the first energy bar for women. And the company is actually, they're owned by Cliff Bar and they're very progressive and they, um, they pay everyone equally, and they also they um, sponsor like mountain biking teams, and they pay the right from the beginning. They pay the women's team the same amount as they paid the men's team, so they were into to uh, equal pay right from the beginning. So they're quite a progressive company that wasn't really coming through in their in their branding around Luna Bar. Their branding, as you can see on the left, was sort of about the woman who has it all. She is a very successful professional, but she also has a family and she keeps fit. So she's this, she's this perfect superwoman who can do it all and Luna Bar can help you do that. Um, that was working for them. They were a successful brand. However, other uh, women's energy bar brands came along that were stealing share from them. And the Women's March happened uh, and, and the election in 2016 happened. And all of a sudden that positioning started to seem um, not very cool actually in kind of a weird way to talk about women and telling, that, telling you that you have to be perfect and you have to do it all and you have to juggle everything perfectly. And they brought us in to talk about women's empowerment. So this was a cross-cultural study where we looked not just at uh, brands who were talking about women's empowerment, uh, like um, Soul Cycle or Secret or Cover Girl or Thinks, but also um, or Nike or Always, but also celebrities who were kind of talking to women's empowerment, as well as media sources, so uh, magazines, blogs, social media, hashtags, and so forth. Uh, and we did a study. I, ha I greeked out the actual information here, but we created a map for them showing them different territories of women's empowerment. And we helped them understand that um, they had kind of moved away from a territory which they still had a, a right to be in, which was more political than where they were now. And they, it actually, and it's actually a very happening space, especially after 2016. And they could get back there without, and we thought they could get there without losing their, their consumers. They wouldn't, it wouldn't be too big of a shift to go there. So as you can see on the right-hand side, they've now closely associated themselves with the U.S. women's soccer team and their fight for pay equity. And as you can see, it's a much more um, political, it's still about female empowerment, but as you can see, it's a quite different uh, take on it. Right. So that was a kind of a dramatic example of like how a brand could shift positioning while still keeping a lot of its core equities, but you know, shift positioning somewhat on this map that we created for them uh, based on a kind of semiotic study. Wow. Yeah, big shift indeed. Lo lots of questions that will come up even on that, but um, I think we've run out of time. Um, and uh, this was a very in-depth illustration, I think, of what semiotics can do. Um, my question was going to be, where do people turn if they want to talk to you, if they want to know more, etc.? You've got the slide right up there. Do you also have a website where some of this is accessible? Is that the... 
Uh, semiovox.com, I would guess. Semiovox.com. Yep, we have. Uh, we talked to some of our case studies. We uh, we pu we push pu publish new content there constantly, and you can sort of um, you see kind of uh, codes from past studies as well. So it's, you can search it for different things. Excellent, wonderful. Well, Josh, thanks so much for spending a lot of time with us here. Uh, but there's a lot of interest. Semiology is kind of still this mysterious thing. So I hope we'll, we've uh, helped to clarify that a little bit and, and, and got people interested in this actually as uh, what I think is a wonderful tool of helping you understand your brand and then thinking about where it could go from there. Thanks again. Hey, Pete, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Hey. Bye. Now I need to understand how to stop the recording. Ah, here we go. Boom.